entitled The Sweatshop Regime, Laboring Bodies, Exploitation and Garments Made in India. Alessandra is a lecturer here in the, the SOAS Department of Development Studies, and her work cuts across the fields of globalization and labor informalization, global value chains and labor, labor standards and CSR, gender and feminist theory, and the political economy of India. Her research has uh, been been conducted with both the British Academy, ESRC, DFID, and she's published in journals such as Third World Quarterly, Oxford Development Studies, and Competition and Change. She is presenting this new book to, to us this evening, which draws on her long-standing and in-depth research on the, the garment sector in India. It's uh, theoretically grounded in Marxist and feminist insights, and it's not quite published yet, so we can't sell copies to you this evening, but you should find some, some leaflets around if you want to take one of those with you. Uh, we're also really, really pleased to welcome Nyla Kabir tonight to discuss the book with us. Nyla, as many of you will know, is a professor of development and gender at the LSE and is one of the leading academics in, in her field. Her highly distinguished career has seen her teach both here at SOAS and IDS Sussex and she's been actively involved in the policy arena. Her works include reverse realities, gender and social protection uh, and organizing women workers in the informal economy. Before I hand over to Alessandra, if any of you want to tweet, the hashtag is SOASDevStudies. And I just wanted to say a quick thank you to all the volunteers that uh, across the department that have helped us tonight. Alessandra. Thank you so much for the very generous introduction. I hope you can all hear me. Yeah, anyway, I have a very loud voice. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here because this project actually started here, so I think it's just um, as it should be, that is the first venue where I presented, and I see in the audience basically half of my acknowledgement in the book, which is uh, great to see, and also a lot of people that have seen the many avatars of um, um, this uh, uh, research. Now, um, this has been a very long journey for me, it lasted around... Uh, um, 10 years, so we went through very many different qualitative phases. And uh, although I was always concerned with uh, researching the sweatshop in India, of course, this phase has also meant that I applied different methods during these 10 years. I was first concerned with mapping the work of uh, major garment producers in India, and then I became instead more concerned with uh, the interactions with global buyers. Then instead from there, I got more concerned with the difference between factory and non-factory work. Uh, and finally, with the... Uh, um, uh, the work of labor contractors. So in a sense, the book reflects this uh, process of building up and layering. And uh, um, um, in, uh, this long journey has a more basic uh, scope, in my view, and a more complex one. And at a very basic level of analysis, it's simply an account that wants to join the many um, uh, concerned uh, studies uh, with the labor conditions in uh, this industry that always managed to reconstitute itself uh, as an industry incapable to uh, provide uh, good working conditions. Uh, there are just uh, after uh, the, the recent event uh, from 2013 from Rana Plaza, there have been uh, a number of accounts concerned with the working condition in the sector, ranging from uh, the book by Jeremy Seabrook, The Song of the Shirt, uh, to um, the quite famous, I would say, anti-capitalist book of fashion by Tansy Hoskins. Uh, and of course, uh, Nyla herself, among her many contributions to the field, has written this beautiful book on uh, garment in Bangladesh in 2000, which was one of the sources of inspiration uh, for the project itself uh, that I um, engage with on India, The Power to Choose. Now, this is at the very basic level, so I don't mind to join a chorus of, uh, you know, studies that are concerned with bad working conditions worldwide. But also, I would say the book has a much more ambitious uh, design uh, and aspiration, which is then to theorize the sweatshop and to theorize it, to make sense of its extraordinary resilience across time. So we have spoken a lot about Rana Plaza in 2013, but as a matter of fact, the first ever disaster in the history of the garment industry is to be placed in New York City in 1911, where 147 workers, women workers actually, um, died following what was the first uh, industrial disaster in the history of the industrial relation in the sector. And, uh, um, um, and we have uh, 
the very similar sort of uh, uh, circumstances uh, uh, after 100 years. And during these 100 years, we have seen a lot of uh, measures that have been put in place uh, to try to address the working condition in the sector. So this extraordinarily resilient, in my view, can only be explained by theorizing the sweatshop as a regime, namely in a quite complex definition that I give in the book, uh, a regime uh, a system of labor exploitation and oppression which uh, comprises multiple spaces of work that crosses realms of both production and reproduction of the workforce uh, and entails both processes of production and circulation. And also a regime uh, which has a very specific uh, signature that lives on the laboring bodies even in the absence uh, of industrial disasters because it always has a very specific health depleting effects on uh, the laboring bodies of the workers uh, involved. So in a nutshell, this very complex definition can be summarized as the sweatshirt in this book being theorized as a set of labor relations as opposed to a place or a space. So not the small space as opposed to the large factory, etc., but the type of social relations which cross productive and reproductive domains. Now, this definition allows me, and of course the ethnographic journey that uh, the, the book presents, allows me to engage with three key debates. One is the one on industrial modernity, and particularly um, with ideas of stagism, is the cheap labor model ultimately something which is temporary and it will go away. Uh, the second debate is that of modern slavery, which is, if you want, this, uh, the opposing side of the coin, much more gloomier. Are this the modern slave of the global economy? And the third is the one on ethical consumerism that I've written a fair amount before. So today I'll just focus, uh, for reason of time, mainly on the first, uh, um, on the first two. So before um, I actually give you a sense of the... Um, structure of the books and the way in which this regime is shaped, I think I have to um, sort of give you a sense of the literatures that the book engages with and also some of the sources of inspiration. For a book that is called The Sweatshop Regime, I cannot but start uh, dealing with the, the literature on labor regimes, uh, which of course was uh, quite influential in uh, the development of my ideas. The work of Michael Buravoy on factory regimes, where he actually highlights uh, how for understanding in labor, we have to match studies of the abode of production, i.e. of relations in production, with the, an understanding of capital labor relations more generally uh, in India in this case, and indeed at the global level. Uh, there are a number of very interesting spins that actually started off from Bora Voy's work, uh, attempts to expand the concept of labor regimes to uh, areas of social reproduction. I'm talking about the work of Chris Smith and Poon Nai in particular with reference to China. Um, and also instead uh, uh, references to patterns of labor control which have interested other authors, particularly in the realm of geography, starting from the work of Jonas uh, all the way to um, uh, the, the recent work by Mark Anner and also some of the work that has been recently done by Jonathan Patton and, um, on rural India. And of course, uh, we have been engaging with this literature in the context of a project on labor conditions and the working poor led by uh, Jens Lerko, who is uh, sitting in the second row on the right. So the uh, use of the word sweatshop as opposed to labor regime has a very specific uh, rationale here and is uh, that I wanted uh, to... Uh, um, focus the attention both on patterns of production and reproduction um, and not simply uh, focus on uh, uh, the, the productivist uh, uh, stage, um, but b going also beyond uh, uh, a theorization that only looks at uh, the daily social reproduction of the workforce. What does it mean? Poon and, and, and Smith actually look at uh, what workers actually do in the industrial areas where they work, while he said they wanted to have a, uh, wanted to have a longer durée in terms of uh, the overall livelihoods uh, of uh, this uh, workforce. And also the term sweatshop, of course, allows me to also point uh, the, um, directly um, 
um, underlying the fact that we are looking at uh, highly precarious and harsh uh, uh, working conditions that are systematically reproduced uh, um, by um, the industry. And in a sense, uh, the book tries to unveil all the very complex processes through which this uh, production of working poverty is uh, um, actually perpetuated. And in a sense, it wants to contribute uh, to an analysis of how the so-called cheap labor model is uh, all but a natural comparative advantage in developing societies, which is instead, uh, and instead is mainstreamed as uh, so very much, uh, particularly in economics, uh, uh, models of uh, uh, trade liberalization. So comparative advantage in cheap labor has to be constructed and uh, in very complex ways through complex strategies and there's a huge number of actors that participate in uh, uh, this endeavor. And while the construction of comparative advantages has been widely acknowledged in the literature with reference to goods and service, you can remember Hajun Chan's work or Anwar Shaikh's work uh, on this, uh, very little has been done, if not a bit by the feminist literature on this particular um, issue. Finally, the reference to the word sweatshop allows me also to address uh, the interplays that I think intercur between processes of production and circulation, and this I think I'll have to explain more in depth as uh, we go along in the presentation. Um, of course, uh, if you look at uh, studies of the garment industry, you cannot escape from uh, what is called chain analysis, i.e. study of global commodity chains that have contributed a lot in terms of uh, unveiling the workings of the industry. However, although I indeed learned a lot from this literature, I still think that when it comes to labor, it's systematically unable to treat labor as anything but as a residual. So it's, you are able through chain analysis to see what happens uh, in terms of what a global process impacts upon labor, but you are unable to make labor the center of the analysis, which instead methodologically was uh, a fundamental aspect for me behind this project. So uh, to start from labor as a prism for the study of globalization and development, uh, rather than looking at as the global economy impacted labor. Um, representational issues, I think, are very relevant indeed, particularly as I feel labor has been massively marginalized from the study of development for such a long time. Um, of course, as uh, the commodity chain represents a device to study global capitalism, also here, the study of the sweatshop regime does something very similar. So these are dispositives, ultimately, for, um, for scholars to talk about capitalism. And indeed, it's the case for me. Uh, so the uh, representation um, of the sweatshop regime that I propose here wants to speak about uh, a very specific vision of capitalism and a very specific vision of class. So a vision of capitalism as a system that is uh, uh, based primarily on the extraction of uh, labor surplus uh, through multiple forms of exploitation, so which is not defined necessarily by the presence or absence uh, of free wage labor, i.e. this means that the labor relations can manifest in many different ways and people can be exploited in myriad different uh, uh, ways. And these ways are not transitional. These ways are actually quite uh, stably um, defined. So uh, in relation to class, uh, the type of uh, uh, understanding of class which is proposed here is indeed uh, one where class is uh, seen as uh, given by a multiplicity of labor relations uh, uh, but is formed uh, across productive and reproductive realms. So I do not find satisfying accounts that part starts from production to define the working class. And, as particularly the social profile of the workers involved in the sweatshop are fundamental to understand where in the employment ladder these workers are located. A woman, a male migrant, a child, they all have a very specific role and specific tasks to perform in the context of the sweatshop regime. So in a sense these are not residuals, we cannot look at social traits and social identity 
as uh, simply an add-on to class, uh, but these are fundamental co-constitutive elements uh, of processes of class formation. So the books which I found most inspiring for these theorizations, first of all, Jairus Banerjee Theory, Theory as a History, 2010 book, and my early reading of Jairus I owe to Alfredo, who's also sitting in second row, during a, <laughs> a study group uh, uh, that we ran a million years ago or so, on liberalism. Um, and uh, the other very influential book for me was, uh, has been Henry Bernstein's uh, Classes of Labor, Contribution. And uh, from the feminist literature, I uh, owe a lot, or these books owe a lot of his inspiration to the work of Maria Mies, uh, Patriarchy and Accumulation on the Global Scale, and uh, the um, more recent contribution by Silvia Federici, the Caliban and the Witch. So that the idea of social reproduction are co constitutive of processes of working class uh, formation. Finally, to give you a sense of, uh, you know, the, 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 also the empirical material, where it comes from, of course, it's not a case. India is hardly a case study here. It was a fundamental inspiration, the way in which I could um, engage with global capitalism as well as class, uh, for me, an engagement with Indian political economy. And I hope the book actually also contributes to it, the understanding of uh, uh, Indian political economy in different ways. First of all, um, in terms of uh, uh, understanding the making of global India, how it's just actually unraveling, and how this is actually taking place uh, on the shoulders of the working poor, and how effectively the informal economy, which has always characterized massively uh, Indian capitalism, is actually taking over and dictating the rhythms uh, also in more formal realms of production, so that you have an expansion of processes of labor informalization that touches upon both formal and informal realms, so touches in this case both factories as well as uh, home-based uh, uh, realms. Um, also, another set of contribution to which I hope uh, uh, the book does is an understanding of India that is based on regions. And I think too little is uh, discussed with reference to massive countries, emerging economies like India, but I would say like others, in terms of the very different industrial trajectories that characterize uh, this uh, massive social formations. And indeed, uh, understanding regionalism in India uh, actually um, is fundamental to understand the various trajectories uh, of capitalism you find. And indeed, the, mo the fieldwork at the basis of this project was uh, fairly mobile, so that I started in Delhi, continued in uh, Ludhiana, then Jaipur, then I went all the way east to Calcutta, went back to Bombay, and then down south uh, to uh, <coughs> Chennai, um, Bangalore, and Tirupur. They, I will present to you very um, soon in a map. And then back to Delhi, trying to make sense also of the peri-urban and rural areas that increasingly are incorporated into garment production well beyond uh, urban places. So you really see an entire country at work. <coughs> now this is uh, from the table of contents. So the book, what it tries to do is to convince you that uh, not only we can theorize the sweatshop as a regime, but this regime is composed by very specific factors, which then correspond more or less uh, to the majority of the chapters uh, that are presented in the book. And the first uh, chapter after the introduction wants to convince you of the case of the relevance to shift the attention from the chain to the sweatshop, i.e. from capital to labor, and then the following chapters each deal with one of the aspects of the sweatshop regime, starting with the, the uh, correspondence between physical and social materialities of production, and I will get to what I mean by this in a moment, then continuing to <coughs> the presence of multiple patterns of unfreedom and difference in the industry, uh, not just in terms of uh, uh, gender and caste, but also mobility, geographical provenance, etc. Um, and then he continues uh, trying to unpack the sweatshop as a joint enterprise. Well, the process of surplus extraction, i.e. the production of working poverty in the end, uh, cannot be ascribed only to a couple of bad guys, 
but instead is a very much shared endeavor and uh, th there is a division of labor whereby different actors have a different uh, uh, role to play. Um, finally, uh, another factor deals with uh, the representation of the, sweat the sweatshop as a bodily regime, a regime that leaves a sign on the bodies of the workers even when we do not have necessarily industrial disasters uh, at play. Now, starting with the first uh, of uh, starting with the first of uh, um, our features, what do I mean with the physical and social materiality? Well, there is a very strong correspondence in India between uh, patterns of product specialization, i.e., which garments we talk about. If we all look at each other, we're wearing different things. So the word garment actually says something and nothing. They're very different themes, very different processes, very different product cycles. Well, there is a correspondence between these physical features uh, and the social processes of labor, or production and labor, they are connected to them. So in a sense, it's a bit like, uh, tell me what you do and I'll tell you who you are. So you see this uh, correspondence quite strikingly. Um, and in a sense, uh, it's what establishes this direct connection between uh, competition and exploitation that actually Marx talked about. And I don't think it's a case that he started chapter one of uh, volume one in Capital with a chapter on commodities. Now, I'm very much aware that when you talk about physical materiality, you, you can be accused immediately of commodity fetishism. But my contention here is just that only by studying commodity fetishism, you can actually see how employers fetishize labor and how effectively commodity fetishism, although we have to unveil it through our analysis, has a very real effect in the world of labor. So I'll introduce you to how um, global buyers uh, and outsourcers see the country. So I welcome you to, uh, well, you can call it India Mart or you can call it sort of uh, India H&M version. So if you talk to any buyer or uh, global retailers, they, this is how they see the country. It's a massive garment mall with different garment collections available at different floors. And this, of course, corresponds to different trajectories that historically the industry has gone through. So you see the presence of uh, niche garment production in the north, in uh, the areas of uh, Delhi and the national capital region, which is the metropolitan area around it, then in Jaipur, Ludhiana, and well, partially Calcutta. In Delhi, you have embroidered ladies' wear. In uh, Jaipur is where you source your <coughs> printed items. In Ludhiana is where you go if you need woolens, and uh, in Calcutta is where you go to source uh, kids wear, um, workwear, and uh, nightwear. All these niche production are characterized more or less by <coughs> very complex and uh, fragmented product cycles, which means that you have smaller batches of orders, generally speaking. So H&M will source there your nice skirts, which is embroidered uh, with a nice uh, design, or uh, the t-shirt or shirt you're, you're wearing with uh, a funky printed uh, uh, drawing. And instead, uh, in Ludiana, they'll source uh, uh, wool and, and sweaters. <coughs> if you go down south, you find a completely different uh, world of seams and products. And uh, here, you find your classic global product. So you have uh, uh, basic production, jeans, jackets, shirts, everything that is uh, slightly easier to do on an assembly line. And also, of course, uh, down south, so you find larger factories on assembly line production. So for engaging with the niche production, you have to have shorter cycles, while instead for larger um, batches of basic orders, you will need the larger factory. Now, this, uh, uh, the, Mumbai is actually a center for the registration. You, you have to imagine it as the till of India Mart, if you want, right? I mean, they don't do much anymore, but you have a massive number of uh, uh, Indian retailers uh, that they have nothing to envy to any Marks and Spencer. They're just located there. Now, this being the map of the products, this is the map of the people. And these are fundamentally different sets of labors that you find at work. 
So again, starting from the north one, we've seen we have niche markets <coughs> and uh, we have um, um, a more complex product cycles. You find uh, very complex combinations of factory and non-factory labor. Factory labor is characterized by um, male migrants, mainly from the Hindi belt of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. And you have combinations of uh, non-factory labor in home-based uh, establishment uh, or home-based like establishment. Your armies of home workers you find here, and from the biggest hubs like Delhi, you find that these uh, um, home workers actually are sought after all the way through the interland. In the south, completely different. You actually enter a factory, and voila, you find 80 to 90 percent female workers on an assembly line, much uh, larger venues. Uh, and of course, it makes a lot of sense uh, in terms of cost minimization to deploy gender as a principal axis uh, of discrimination because you're able to pay these uh, workers less. So there is a very strong correspondence between the physical features of the commodity we see and the type of laborers that we find at work, which leads me to a second component of the stretch of pressure as a regime, which uh, uh, deals with patterns of difference and unfreedom. Now, if you look at the literature on sweatshops, uh, what I find deeply dissatisfying is generally uh, dealing with unfreedom uh, focused primarily on what I would call the excesses or the extremes. So instances of modern slavery, partially because this is sensationalized in uh, um, outlets such as The Guardian, for instance. And uh, um, you have the generally, there is a very liberal understanding of uh, unfreedom that is connected to forced labor or bondage. On the other hand, in the Marxist literature, you have a much more interesting debate around uh, dispossession, about ownerships of means of production, but also this literature actually falls short to try to map all the possible ways in which unfreedom manifests in the industry. So if we go back to our map, for instance, Depending on which understanding of our freedom we deploy, we will have different sets of contribution to make vis-a-vis -vis how these people actually live and work. So if we adopt a sort of focus only on bondage, then generally we will find instances up north related to um, primarily labor contracting in home-based realms where workers are tied by advances to contractors, while in the south we find the rising instances which are linked to the rise of dormitories that host young female workers, particularly in the areas of Tirupur and Bangalore. So with a very restrictive view on unfreedom, this is what you get. If you instead talk about unfreedom in terms of dispossession, it becomes much more trickier. And in terms of ownership of means of production, you have that the combination of free and unfree labor you see correspond more or less to the distinction between factory and non-factory work. And uh, again, link this with patterns of debt. However, I would contend that if you look at wage levels, uh, you can find actually interesting trade-offs between different forms of unfreedom. So for instance, uh, my work in Uttar Pradesh with the home workers has revealed that, as a matter of fact, the workers which you will be able to define as neo-bonded, i.e. those that receive advances, are not the worst off in terms of take-home wages. The women are, which will receive nothing from the contractors because they're already attached uh, to the walls of the house. <coughs> in this sense, patriarchal unfreedom, or generally speaking, social forms of unfreedom, can actually establish trade-offs with the economic forms of uh, unfreedom. This is an important point that I'll go back to in the conclusions for dealing with the debate on modern slavery. A fourth, uh, um, third still, the third <laughs> factor that I'm, um, uh, I consider it as constitutive of the sweatshop as a regime, is our need to understand the sweatshop as a joint enterprise. And I think this is uh, done too little. And generally, there is a, a tendency to try to focus the attention only on a few culprits. So you have this uh, catch the bad guy approach. And the bad guy actually shifts with the, depending on which literatures you actually look at. 
so they're just uh, a part of uh, the literature concerns uh, with uh, attacking globalization as imperialism that focuses a lot on uh, the power of global buyers as if the entire uh, enterprise of the sweatshop could be ever orchestrated from, a, from sitting from a global chair, which is very unlikely. And, and I would say that this is one of the dominant views, this is the demonization of global buyers, and don't get me wrong, global buyers do all sorts of bad things. But I would say that the sweatshop is so complex in its reproduction that uh, also uh, other actors have to be considered. First of all, um, suppliers, of course, and some of them are massive. <laughs> we get to this, uh, the, the, the difficulties in applying um, categorization based only on geographical location in a moment. Um, and also, increasingly, also a number of intermediaries which have come um, under the light in recent times more than anything, labor contractors. Now, all these actors participate in creating platforms for surplus extraction. So they all have a role to play in the reproduction of working poverty. It's more about understanding which is the division of labor and so how to act and against what to act in terms of policy options we have. But we'll never find the one magic formula only focusing on a set of actors that will actually, uh, will, is gonna be able to uh, address the uh, resilience of uh, um, the uh, sweatshop. Uh, now, there are two chapters in particular where I try to uh, theorize uh, the um, sweatshop as a joint enterprise. There are chapter number four and five, one dealing with the regional lord and the, uh, so the regional player in a sense, how to understand them. And, uh, a second one that deals with brokers, uh, with labor contractors, uh, and what they do. And I would say in both chapters, uh, what I try to address uh, is uh, the linkages that occur between different actors, because after all, capital is capital is capital. And also how uh, an understanding of how the process of surplus extraction takes place in the sweatshop only based on production falls short to explain <coughs> how you have the systematic reproduction of working poverty. And of course, I don't have time to sort of go through all of that, but hopefully I'll just uh, give you some snippets. So first, on uh, this over uh, demonization of global buyers, which I'm very sympathetic to in many respects, but I think uh, that it risks uh, to be uh, an analysis that uh, over-represent the power of the global over the so-called local, and also that places the local in a very awkward position, because we have a sort of very orientalist view, or there is a risk of an orientalist view of uh, the poor supplier that is actually subordinated to the action of the global buyers. And there are some people that are interviewed <coughs> in India that have very little to envy um, uh, global actors uh, for, and actually, they should be conceptualized as global actors uh, themselves. And instead, this uh, uh, focus on uh, the uh, guys at the top is uh, something that you see in the search of accounts uh, uh, very much. You have that the bad guy changes. In the 1990s, when I started reading about the industry, the evil monster was Katie Lee Gifford that used to design clothes for Walmart. Now, here, uh, she's been substituted in the imaginary of people with uh, Ortega, who's uh, the owner of Zara. But still, you have this understanding that the global buyers are the solely responsible. Now, this is a picture that's uh, taken uh, from the last tie-up that has been signed between Zara and uh, Trent, which is the clothing retail arm of Tata. Uh, so that is... Uh, Pablo Isla and uh, Noel Tada, they even wear the same tie. And uh, actually, the deal is a billion pounds deal, where Tada actually owned 49% and Zara owned 51%. So this to give you a sense of how would you go and um, then separate who's global and who's the regional actor in this case is uh, really complex and problematic. India is developing very fastly its own brands, and some of them 
actually some of us that travel to India are very attached to, like Fab India. And I, I have to break it to you that 8% uh, of Fab India has just been sold two years ago to the Louis Vuitton group. So that again, how we uh, sort of substitute what is global and local capital is becoming increasingly a headache. Um, so in a sense, all these actors participate uh, in the same way in the reproduction of working poverty, and uh, both in terms of their retail strategies as well as production strategies, with these two sets of strategies often uh, interplaying with each other. So you have, for instance, uh, a set of very powerful retailers in India. They also own manufacturing production and will decentralize uh, their orders on the basis of uh, where to source different collections across the mall. So they behave exactly like a buyer. Some of them have some manufacturing capacities, some others do not have, and this uh, combination between production and circulation is kept very much. Now, this um, is not even particularly historically new. If you look at the whole history of the textile sector, as beautifully represented by uh, historians like Sven Beckert in the Empire of Cotton, but also Tiltanka Roy, uh, or uh, Yello and uh, Barta Sarati, they will still uh, refer to the history of uh, Indian Ocean trade uh, as a history uh, where a cosmopolitan uh, community of uh, global merchants coming from all over the world actually managed <coughs> to craft uh, the trade. So it's not a surprise that in this new avatar we have something very similar actually taking place. And this is valid for textile as for many other industries. If you look at the beautiful account by Jairus Banerjee again on the opium trade and its linkages with the city of London during colonial times. And actually on the opium trade you can simply read Amit Ghosh novels which are a beauty. Now, on the, these relations between production and circulation, and the fact that to understand working poverty, we have to go beyond the classic Marxist account, but only focus on production, I would say a lot has to tell also a study of uh, the lower rank guys, the labor contractors, which in recent times have emerged, particularly in the literature on labor standards, as the evil link in the chain. If, if we only could cut this guy off, then we will have direct uh, relations with laborers. Uh, this is something that at policy levels is proposed uh, by international organizations, by local NGOs, etc. It is that many of these guys are not necessarily intermediaries at all. They actually participate very actively to processes of surplus extraction in very crude terms by making surplus extraction possible in the first place. So when you have at the lower ranks uh, the linkages between factories and home-based realms of work, uh, a first problem that you have is the subsistence uh, of extremely poor artisans which are linked to the sweatshop uh, in various ways. Um, now, how would you guarantee their subsistence? Do you guarantee your, the subsistence by the provision of advances? And a lot has been written about advances in terms of their role in uh, reproducing uh, and freedom, and that is definitely a way to look at that. But also advances are crucial to create the very possibility to extract surplus uh, from uh, laborers. Because uh, otherwise, uh, quite simply, these people would starve and you would not be able to actually accumulate. So in a sense, the advance also is a productive investment for the contractor, which hence has to be seen as a petty capitalist uh, and not necessarily as uh, an intermediary. So that again, in policy terms, uh, only focusing designs uh, in trying to cut the middleman might not be the best option you have. And we've done a lot of work in Barili in trying to understand how the system of advances actually worked, and again, how it related to patterns of unfreedom, who, get, who gets the advances and who doesn't, which is a crucial question um, uh, that, again, explains the relevance of the social identity in uh, shaping the different opportunities that different workers have uh, in the sweatshop. The final, um, the final uh, um, factor shaping the sweatshop as a regime that I want to talk about, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, 
health depleting um, component. So the fact that the sweatshop is always uh, bad news for the laboring bodies, uh, not just when you have a Rana Plaza, when over a thousand workers die, but uh, you always have a systematic process of depletion of health that manifests differently on the basis of the different uh, realm of work of workers. So of course, we interviewed workers uh, during uh, the uh, project that uh, I carried out together with Jens and others. And of course, workers in factories report uh, different uh, health issues uh, than workers uh, in the lower ranks of the chain in on base realms. For instance, in the factory, it's very um, common that they report uh, um, allergies or back pain. We have waves of fainting in the, uh, in the larger industries that actually bring us back to Ai Wang's account on uh, factory workers in Malaysia. And uh, these waves of fainting are also not necessarily only characteristics of uh, India, they were reported in, in, with reference to Cambodia in a beautiful article of the New York Times uh, by Julia Wallace that was uh, titled quite provokingly, Workers of the World Faint. <laughs> now, the, uh, however, in each and every segment of the sweatshop regime, you do have that the health depleting effects are so severe that eventually will have uh, a very harmful impact on the body. And uh, you see that employers in the context of India never internalize the cost of social reproduction of the labor force. So they're able, across all the different venues of work, not to engage with their provisions. So how do they do that? Well, they do that because in India the workforce is mainly uh, circulatory. And the process of labor circulation cannot be only understood as classically is done in relation to patterns of internal migration between urban areas and the village. There's been done extraordinary work on, uh, in Indian literature on this, and the work of Ian Bremen is uh, astonishingly <laughs> vivid in like uh, showing you, uh, taking you through how the process of uh, internal migration actually works, but I would say that with reference to the sweatshop, um, it's only part of the story when it comes to understanding how you have this uh, ever patterns of circulation reproduced uh, and how employer can simply, you know, wash their hands over the provision to the, wor to the um, workforce. So there are three types of circulation which we found in the survey uh, connected to the projects where there, was, uh, there were interviews of over 320 workers in the more organized segments and uh, interviews of 70 workers in all <laughs> sectors in the national capital region. And we have the yearly circulation, but also other two types of circulation, one connected uh, to um, the uh, industrial area and one to the life cycle of the individual. And I'll quickly go through them we found 30% of workers uh, circulating classically between the NCR and the village, so going back on a yearly basis. But we found an astonishingly higher rate of people circulating within the industrial area. Workers, 60% of workers reported to work in the same unit for less than a year, which means that the factory is never the venue that actually can uh, sort of deliver social provisions, also because in India you have no portability of social contributions. So basically, the factory, the employer is never forced to internalize the cost of the social reproduction of the workforce, and uh, all workers, 80% of them, reported that they basically access private clinics for anything that concerns their health, even those in tier one factories. So one of the other classic stories about sweatshops is uh, larger unit will deliver better. We found that this was hardly the case <coughs> because workers had a very high level of breaking service, which meant that they exited the factories very early. And wage levels across the sectors was extraordinarily similar. So if you take social contributions aside, which are paid by larger factories, uh, but then they go wasted because workers cannot actually uh, access them and they will leave the factory before, take home wages were very similar, set between 6,700 and 6,900 rupees. So in a sense, for a worker 
doesn't make much much difference who you work for if uh, you know that you're gonna circulate and anyway you're gonna lose the social contributions uh, that you would possibly mature. So this is also why there is this uh, sort of uh, every production of this very flexible geography is designed by capital but is co-designed by labor. Those workers make very rational choices. Why should I care if uh, who I work for if after all more or less I earn the same? Um, and finally, the third uh, important uh, aspect of circulation relates to the march out of the sweatshop that uh, very few people, particularly those concerned with uh, or they have a benign vision of uh, industrialization by stageism referred to, which is how long these workers ultimately work for. And we found that the majority of workers were finished work in the workshop, in the sweatshop, whichever the venue, whichever the chambers of the sweatshop uh, they work with, they finish by 30, 35, which is really young. But, and to an extent, you can talk about uh, retrenchment. So to an extent, they're sent away. But to another extent, if you also consider the narratives of health, uh, they actually are exhausted and simply go back home eventually as sucked oranges, as nicely put by Jan Bremen after 10, 15 years of engagement in the sweatshop. So there is this production of human waste, uh, which is also very quick inside uh, the sweatshop and also has big implications for how we think about uh, the cheap labor model in stages terms or not. So on this, I, I'll just spend a few minutes on conclusion. <clears throat> and in the conclusion, the books try to engage with a number of different things, ranging from uh, industrial modernity to modern slavery to ethical consumerism, and of course, of course, struggles. And I'll focus here only on the first two because of what I presented. Um, and the first uh, uh, debate that on industrial transition. I think the study of the sweatshop regime actually puts to rest a very benign account of industrialization as necessarily entailing a stages process of improvement. Because actually, this is not what emerges from the field findings themselves. So the idea that the cheap labor model is just a temporary evil and that you have to go through that for a period of time because eventually you have an improvement in working conditions is not something that I feel I can subscribe to after this year spent in studying the sweatshop. I haven't seen any evidence related to that, particularly if you adopt a view of working poverty, which is uh, also time-based. It's not just uh, a matter of static comparisons, but you also want to ask, uh, in the context of the livelihood of a worker, um, if uh, the engagement in the industry will make a huge difference or not. Would they live with a massive level of savings? What do they do after? Which is one of the key questions, in fact, to ask. We're trying to map now um, with the, some people, especially for Bangalore, life histories of what workers do after they leave the sweatshop so young. And there seems to be a narrative whereby they go back engaging with the same type of informal work uh, that released them originally to the sweatshop. So there isn't this uh, sort of linear, uh, sort of progressive transformation of livelihoods that from informality get all the way to this industrial future. Um, and I think this is a very important point to make, particularly to counter what is a very resilient narrative um, that instead places the cheap labor model as one of the stages. Uh, and you know, if you close your eyes, go through that, and eventually you have improvement uh, uh, happening. This is not what you see on the ground. If the, we can call the cheap, this type of cheap labor model temporary, it's only for workers. <laughs> it's very temporary for workers because they will exit in 10, 15 years uh, as a new batch actually arrives uh, and is welcomed in, because they will be partially ex exhausted, partially they will be retrenched, and a new batch will be uh, then hired, etc. 
And also the idea of big is beautiful, which is fundamental in the study of stagism, that you know you have an increase in factory sizes and this is so we're all beneficial, is also something that I do not feel I, I can substantiate by my findings because the level of uh, overall wages is quite similar. Uh, and I think there has been a major shift in the 1990s uh, with the, um, a, a, a stage of uh, uh, more aggressive processes of flexibilization of the workforce. So it could be the case up to the 1990s, but now it's definitely not the case. In terms of the modern slavery debate, I would say that going back to our consideration on our freedom, I think the understanding of uh, these workers still as the slaves of the global economy is really unhelpful, both analytically as well as politically. First, I would just want to highlight how understandings of uh, slavery under, like, that, that embrace uh, this uh, sort of uh, um, viewpoint can be hijacked politically in all possible ways. We've seen the, the, the paternalistic language used to actually check migrants where they uh, came from with reference to the so-called European migration crisis that Bridget Anderson has called violent humanitarianism. And I think we have to be very wary of how the language of modern slavery can be hijacked. But more than that, uh, I don't think it's helpful to only focus on, uh, on excesses or understanding of unfreedom that lie outside what is the business as usual in the sector. What is that? The production of unfreedom is a systematic feature of the industry. It comes in very different shapes and forms according to the social profile of the workforce and their location on the employment ladder. Not to add what, what, then what <laughs> how workers see themselves and what they report when they ask about the, um, issues of freedom and unfreedom, and unfortunately I don't have time to go um, into that here. And of course both debates uh, then resonate very much with debates, uh, similar debates that go on with reference to India, which I still think is very fascinated, even the left in India, very fascinated by the, the stages model too much, uh, and instead is not clearly delivering if you look at informalization rates, not just for this industry but for others. And as well, for the, in terms of instead the unfreedom debate, although if you want India leads, and there have been much more interesting study on India on unfreedom that you'll find internationally on modern slavery, still I think the new ways in which uh, you, uh, uh, one can observe uh, new forms of in-work unfreedom also perhaps uh, begs the question of revisiting the, the debate also with reference to the subcontinent. Thank you. Okay, I'll start because this is going to take some time. Um, first of all, I have to apologize, and the organizers have to apologize, because uh, I was given the book, well, actually, I was requested to do this discussion really two days ago. <laughs> and I was given the book uh, electronically, really, a, a, a day and a half ago. And as you would have realized from Alessandra's presentation, this is not a lightweight book. And it's not something, she said, well, just skim read it. You know? Well, actually, it's not a skim readable book. And I have great trouble trying to you know, speed read through all these different chapters and all of that. So I will not be able to do justice, and I said to Alessandra I will not be able to give her the kind of well thought through commentary that she deserves. Uh, so what I'll do instead is just pick out a couple of things that struck me as I was doing my very rapid reading. Uh, I think the first thing that struck me, of course, is that, uh, as Alessandra said, you know, this is not a case study. Uh, this is a study of a number of different countries all stitched together and called India. And therefore, she's able to, through a study of this one country, actually cut across a number of different variations of this sweatshop regime and these labor regimes. And she uh, depicted that very nicely in the graph. Um, and I think uh, this point about the, the relevance, the materiality of the product and its implications for 
the way that uh, the labor processes are organized and so on is a very important one and a very, a very interesting one uh, because again, it's the story that is normally spread out amongst many, other, many different countries. We're seeing it in one country. But there are a couple of comments to make about that. One is, you know, she talks about the actual product, you know, so, I mean, kids wear and nightwear and sportswear. But one of the earlier findings about the materiality of the product of garments that I uh, have always carried with me through my research is this idea of how difficult it is to mechanize certain parts of the process. That the limpness of the texture of garments makes it very, very difficult to mechanize, which is why it has remained very labor intensive. And this labor intensity, I think, is uh, at the heart and the need to, to cut down on labor costs is, I think, at the heart of certain characteristics of the garments industry globally. Uh, that you see in many different forms in many different countries. Uh, one example of it for me was when we did work in Vietnam <coughs> and we looked at the garment industries there and there were three or four sectors that we looked at. One was the state-owned factories for export because the state used to make garments and now it makes garments for export. The other is the foreign ventures, you know, foreign capital-owned garments. Then there were the smaller locally owned garments, and then there was informal work of various other kinds. What was very striking is, of course, as you would expect, that the state-owned garments had the highest labor standards, people have written contracts, everything that you would expect a socialist state to provide its workers, even if they're in a garment factory. The foreign-owned factories were a little bit better, and the locally owned ones were not so good. But the one thing that all the factory sectors had in common was hours of work. That is something that even the socialist state, still the socialist state in Vietnam, trying to export garments to the rest of the world and compete in the international market has not been able to deal with. And it is the long, and you cannot do shifts for various reasons, so it is these long hours of work. Similarly, we did a comparison of export, uh, um, export processing zone factories in Bangladesh with the locally owned factories with others. And again, the export factories had better conditions, etc. But when you divided the hours of work of people in the garment sector, uh, when you divided what they earned by what the hours of work were, actually the returns to labor were not particularly different in these highly, you know, industry. So one of the things I think that has always been at the heart of the garment sector that almost makes it this distinctive is this very labor-intensive, price-elastic, you know, thing that makes it quite hard to um, do anything about that. And you see that in the Indian context. I think what um, Alessandra brings up very nicely is this, the, 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 the variations of the sweatshop regime in the different parts of India. Um, and, the, and the idea of human labor as being used up as, a, as one more piece of raw material that is used up in the process. And there was one figure which didn't come from India that struck me, and that is someone writing about China, the Pearl River Delta in China. And the comment was, in this area, 40,000 fingers are lost every year in the garment set. I mean, that is a very kind of, it, it just tells you something quite uh, graphic about, it tells you something very graphic about one of the points of this regime <coughs> that it's describing, and that is the indifference to the, the, the costs of social of human reproduction. That people do not take any, um, uh, very little responsibility for their workers. And that, uh, and, and, and you know, to some extent, I think it is about a kind of informality that permeates relationships at all levels. So while you may have these huge global buyers who are, you know, very much a part of the formal economy, their relationships to the people who uh, supply them is one of informality, taking very little responsibility. The relationships of the, um, the people who buy from them or who supply them to their own workers is also one of informality. So all along the, the, the chain, we have this uh, 
reluctance to assume any responsibility for whoever comes further down the chain. So while the global buyers are not the only bad guys, so too the employers are not the only bad guys, but they too do what the buyers do, which is to, to default risk and default costs. So that is, seems to be something that is very uh, characteristic of the industry across the world. Well, uh, two things that are distinctive about the oh, Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that are very distinctive about India, again captured in uh, some of her figures, and this was very interesting for me, is that in 2001, the Indian garment sector earned over four, five, earned five and a half billion dollars on the basis of 10,500 factories. The Sri Lankan garment sector earned, same year, $3 billion on the basis of 300 factories. And I think that is telling you something about the Indian story of the missing middle. That you have these great, big industry of the factories, you know, large, and then you have this huge network of what I gathered from your comments, um, Alessandro, almost policy created informality, policy created small sectors that, you know, in the name of um, protecting local industry, you, you encourage these tiny workshops and so on. So I think that is something very uh, distinctive about the Indian industry. The other interesting thing is, I think, uh, when we talk about uh, the, uh, the materiality of the product and how it plays out, this may or may not be coincidence, but there is a very distinct north-south divide in, in the, uh, the gender composition of the labor force. So in the north of India, where in any case female labor force rates are extremely low, we have a, quite a masculine labor force. And in the south of India, where you have much higher women, higher percentage of women working, you do have a far higher percentage of women in there. And I wondered if that had anything at all to do with the way that local kinship systems release women for work or not. Uh, I've only got a minute or two. Um, two points, I think. One is I was very, you know, very um, pleased with the way that uh, Alessandra dealt with these debates around modernization versus um, slavery. And in particular, her point that to describe the garment workers as as, as slaves, modern day slaves, treats them as being in a state of exceptionalism. But actually what they are in is in a specific kind of precarious work which is characterizes you know, the, the labor force right across uh, India and many other parts of the world. Clearly because these workers are working for such high profile factories and such high profile names, there is something about the publicity that surrounds them that is quite distinctive to them. And my final point, in fact, you kind of picked up on it. I, you talk about these workers, you know, work that, yes, they burn out. They do burn out. You cannot work those kinds of hours and retain any, you know, kind of uh, ability to continue. But I would like to see those life histories and what happens to those workers. Because the phrase you use is, you know, the kind of dumped on the waste, waste heap. That's not necessarily the Bangladesh story. You know, they work for a very, and they know they're going to be exploited, and they work very hard, but they do save, and they do, um, they go back to the informal economy, but they go back to self-employment, and they set up enterprises, small-scale enterprises. And to some extent, as long as there is a dearth of formal sector decent jobs, those self-employed uh, ventures is probably preferable to some of the kind of wage labor that is available to them. So I would be very, very interested in hearing how it goes for, for the workers who, who march out, if you like, yes. of the industry. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to get those points. Thanks, because all the points are very relevant. And um, I would agree with you that in terms of uh, the correspondence between the physical and the social, indeed, there is a uh, fetishization of the body as yet another 
raw material. So that, of course, you know, you teach on uh, labor is not a commodity. This is the neoclassical stories. Of course, that is a fiction, but it's a fiction that has very real effect in uh, the world of labor, ultimately. Uh, and there is a, a sentence, a phrase by Silvia Federici, which I think brings the point home quite uh, powerfully. And it is uh, the human body and not the machine, which is the, um, and that is, it's the human body that is the first ever machine invented by capitalism. So, you know, the rhythms, the way in which it's introduced to production, the way in which you can commodify different social traits of the individual for different uh, scopes. So I, I definitely um, um, think uh, that that is a yet another uh, very good way to, um, to put it in respect to uh, raw materials. Well, <clears throat> in terms of uh, um, the garment industry being necessarily a labor-intensive industry, I would say yes to an extent. Of course, there are, depending on which uh, markets you engage with, because there is a massive diversity in terms of final markets, you will have certain um, tasks which is very difficult to mechanize, like embroidery, also where the premium is on the artisanal look. Okay, You go to H&M and you want an Indian-looking shirt. You don't want a industrial-looking shirt. So I think that is uh, the artisanal premium stays uh, and becomes part and parcel of the value addition of the product itself. So of course those are not meant to be mechanized because part of the value addition actually rests on the inability for them to be mechanized. But I think if you look at the uh, labor component of the overall cost of production, this is what instead has changed massively over time, particularly with the upsurge of what we call the fast fashion model. So the fact that today we can decide if uh, we want a pair of jeans or buying an ice cream has to do with process of devalorization of labor. So that the, more or less we found that the employer spent between 5 and 8% of total cost on the labor force, on a labor intensive industry, which is a contradiction in terms. So in a sense, this has shot up profit levels, and I think uh, we should not be satisfied with simply, you know, sort of pointing at the fact that, okay, this is uh, labor-intensive industries, because there is a paradox with the labor-intensive industry where labor is not the major component of the production cost. So you, this is what, in economics, you would expect, um, uh, even following, I would say, the, the, the mainstream story. And uh, in terms of... Uh, India creating informality, definitely I, uh, I would say that I agree with part of the argument because if you look at um, the Indian state's uh, role in uh, the sector um, as actually pushed towards the reproduction of uh, small and medium enterprises, particularly again because these enterprises could uh, eschew their responsibility vis-a-vis -vis their labor force. So for instance, uh, if you have uh, an establishment which is less than uh, uh, 10 or 20 workers, you don't have to register. And uh, if you have uh, an establishment which is less than 100, you have certain responsibilities and not others. If it's below 1,000, you don't have to ask for government permission to shut down. So of course, uh, even in the North, where we have, uh, in terms of the overall capacity, some major suppliers which command uh, 10,000 machines, you go and interview them, how many machines you have, 10,000. But then if you try to find out how many units they have, maybe they have 50. They prefer to keep it separate exactly because they're responding to government incentives, although something has changed since 2000 with the new textile um, policy, which has uh, um, ended what it was called reservation to the sector. Now, the problem is that the Modi government at the moment is uh, revamping Instead, uh, the push towards uh, informality, at the very least, is uh, managing to decouple the informalization of capital from that of labor. So basically, is uh, allowing factories to enlarge, and at the same time, is allowing these factories to employ contract labor. So there is an amendment to the Contract Labor Act that has been under discussion. There is a revisiting on who's a child when it comes to um, child labor. So there are all like labor sort of uh, um, reforms which are underway under this government and don't look uh, good news 
for workers, either in sweatshops or indeed in many, in many other industries, I would, I would say. And finally, on gender, yes, indeed, of course, it's not the case that you have uh, also that division of labor between North and South corresponds to women workforce participation rates. But in a sense, for instance, also in Bangalore, you had male workers originally. So what is it that drives an industry towards uh, finding in a specific set of laborers the ideal workforce? I don't think part dependence is sufficient to explain because uh, if you look at uh, the story of the type of commodities and how they spread across India, it's also a story of final markets. So in a sense, women workers were already available in the South, perhaps, uh, to be deployed as workers, uh, but at the same time, the South set up uh, its sort of an architecture of production where women could guarantee the skilling and the a minimization of cost of production. So in a sense, it's just a story that uh, where you, you have the, the historical trajectory of, of the, uh, gender relations and, and the incorporation of women work, uh, workers uh, in uh, manufacturing activities uh, that matches with which type of market that employers sought to actually make the most out of uh, you know, this raw material that they had um, uh, in the South. And finally, um, what did they do when they exit? For now, we just collected uh, very ethnographic material. They're like uh, life histories of uh, uh, initially 20 workers uh, leaving the Bangalore garment industry. And uh, <clears throat> it seems that the significant uh, story that is recurrent, um, but also interviewing the unions and the labor organization presence is they start doing domestic work. So in a sense, it's not a story of petty entrepreneurship. It's really back to normal. And I think the difference with the Bangladeshi story here, it's twofold. On the one hand, what happens in the 90s? Well, I think there is an acceleration of the cheap labor model. Because before, you could trace all the workers. Even in India, you have stories of women that tell you, I worked in the industry 25 years. That's not the case anymore. So I think it has to do with the increasing patterns of uh, uh, commodity diversification, so patterns of consumption, so that it has intensified work uh, and so workers exit earlier. So that is one. Um, and second, I do think that the, the markets where Bangladesh and India engage with are very different. So that, you know, India is not a competitor for Bangladesh necessarily. So you have the same buyers that both outsource from India and from <coughs> Bangladesh because they know that they actually do very different things there. And the type of uh, production that you find in India, it lends itself more to extreme <coughs> kinds of variety. Fantastic. OK, questions? Yeah. Sorry, I have to wait some time to this, you know. <laughs> this is only the first delivery of the year, as you can see. Yeah, right. on the way. Yeah, exactly. Okay, not together. Thanks very much for your presentation. I have a very uh, small question on the stages narrative. And uh, the rule of labor actually bring about these stages, uh, this uh, shift from very bad work condition to better work, work condition and uh, better wage. And uh, because historically, I mean, at least in other capitalist society, what has uh, not the capitalist of some time, at some point they just say, oh, I'm going to give you a better way. You know, Max is talking about uh, the way um, union uh, as uh, the rule of union, you bring about the shift from absolute surplus value to relative surplus value structure. And uh, in relation to this, I would like uh, to ask if, uh, in, relation, in relation to this uh, in India, the coexistence of small scale production units and big scale manuf uh, plant manufacturing <coughs> is a strategy that capital plays to undermine fragmented labor, uh, the labor force. Because okay, big, big, uh, I mean empirically right now, big uh, workers in big factory are not, uh, it's not related with the higher wage and better working condition, but it's potentially good because in bigger factory it's easier for them to, at this historical has been easier for them to organize and uh, for working in the see. And uh, in relation to these, again, big factories, is, the, is, is capital playing the, let's say, the gender, not just because 
<coughs> lower range, the related with gender, in, uh, but also because is the gender also related with the with this militants uh, trade union uh, <coughs> things? There is any gender specificity about that? That. Um, is it me? Yes, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I've got two full questions. First of all, you know, obviously these problems are exposed now internationally, so proof if the pudding were betting this year. But what is the exposure on the Indian media, newspapers, TV, if any? And um, what is the quality of the debate, uh, if it, it is allowed? Because you were saying that the uh, rules, legislation by the government is particularly neoliberal, I understand. So, you know, if you have only 20 workers, you don't have to register. If you have only 50 workers, I don't know, you, you have only certain pays, a certain amount of NI and so on and so forth. And also, I'm not clear, again, if any, because I understand in India there is a, a strong um, leftist tradition, particularly in some cities like Calcutta. And if there is a strong role of the unions in this, or if the unions are marginalized because of this neoliberal agenda. Thank you. Hi, I just have a question in terms of in terms of how women see themselves, because some of the work that we've been doing at Action Aid, we've been trying to have conversations with garment workers in Bangladesh, for example, and we were saying, well, do you see yourself in a different kind of job? And what else would you do if there were other decent job opportunities within the country? And they were like, yeah, but that doesn't exist. I mean, we are destined to be garment workers. So I'd be quite interested to hear how women see themselves. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so starting from coexistence between small and medium, I think actually it's both. I think uh, there is an element of uh, strategizing around keeping uh, a small unit size in relation to organization, but I don't think that it exhausts all the stories because I generally believe that in certain areas, the product cycle is what drives, I mean, in the world of Anwar Sheikh last week, uh, it's competition that drives how you would decide in terms of, uh, you know, the, what is the, the, the best size uh, composition of, of your overall concern. So, for instance, uh, you have uh, a, a supplier that engages in the production of highly embellished products, uh, and then average embellished products, you will have a constellation of factories where the biggest are dedicated to buyers, where it has a slightly bigger batch of production and less uh, severely fragmented product cycle, and it keeps instead the small, small guys either um, in subcontracting terms or it has a couple of other units uh, where instead it only focuses on, uh, um, on uh, um, this uh, sort of more niche type of production. Then, of course, it has the effect of fragmenting the labor force. So I think it's a mix of both. So let's say that if they have, uh, they always try not to reach sort of uh, a very large capacity, but at the same time, these are also uh, decisions that are influenced by markets, by final markets, as a matter of fact. So it's not just uh, labor driven. Then, of course, the two things might sit well together. and. Uh, I would say that in relation to uh, these shifts from uh, sort of uh, absolute surplus extraction to relative, as well as you know this debate between formal and real subsumption of labor, actually in the sweatshop you find both quite comfortably, comfortably sitting, and there is no evidence that anything is in transit. So these are not transitory forms. The overall concept of transition is redundant with reference to this type of uh, chain capitalism. And I think after 100 years, we can say that, actually. And uh, I was very glad to see the Giles Banerjee's making this point at the higher theoretical level with reference to capitalism, that you don't see the erasure of uh, processes of formal subsumption because they are useful in many industries. And definitely in these industries, uh, you don't see it because uh, you have such variety in terms of markets and product cycles. So I just see 
the home workers and the factory workers uh, living uh, very happily or not happily ever after for quite a while. It's only a question of which interventions uh, can be addressed to uh, either or both that we have to ask, but it, it's not like the small concerns will just disappear. We don't have evidence that suggests this, at least with reference to, to India. In terms of gender, well, of course, at the beginning, the substitution of male with the female workers in the South uh, partially responded to understandings, fetishized understandings about uh, gender and militancy. But as a matter of fact, if you look at the last five years, some of the most interesting strikes that we find in the industry, which are very sporadic and never linked uh, much to the unions, I must say, have been actually carried out by women garment workers because their salary was so ex extraordinarily low vis-à-vis um, -vis the male counterparts up to, up to five years ago that they're the ones that actually staged the campaigns. And recently in Bangalore, I think six to seven months ago, they have been part of another struggle uh, when the government proposed to change the regulation on provident funds. So, I mean, you know, the fact that women are docile and they're nimble fingers, this is all part of the mythology of capitalism, but employers should not uh, trust too much that mythology either, because sometimes it doesn't work that way. Um, now, in terms of uh, uh, what happens in India, well, there is no consumer movement as such in India, but there is a rise in uh, ethically aware consumption. I would say that it's not very big at the moment, but you do have a general push towards uh, issues of ethical trade, at the very least at corporate level. In the last three, four years, you have the rise of the CSR bill, for instance. So there is this bill that decides that corporations have to contribute a percentage in uh, corporate <coughs> social responsibility activities. And for the garment industry, you have an attempt, a very smart attempt, by the Ministry of Textile to uh, develop their own code of conduct. So of course, this doesn't respond to consumer pressures. This responds to the fact that who owns compliance owns the business. <laughs> so that compliance is becoming really expensive for Indian suppliers. <coughs> one of the ways where they can appropriate, uh, at least control more, rather than being exposed to checks from buyers is to develop their own compliant, compliance norms, which they are doing. There is a code which has been launched last year, which is called DISHA, and it wants to be the first ever code of conduct uh, in South Asia that is actually pushed by a country. But unfortunately, the CSR model itself internationally has failed, I would say miserably. After two decades, we're allowed to say that. Um, <coughs> and so it's not particularly good news that you find producing countries that are internalizing that same model that we are fighting internationally because it's not delivering. So I would say that other types of policy are more interesting to monitor. Um, the accord on fire and building safety, although it has limitations, but there are others that are more interesting to watch, I would say. Unions in India are not necessarily particularly strong in the sector, nor in the key sectors where the bulk of informal employment is, unfortunately. So I would say that from outside you have this idea of India's union-led, but you know, in practice, if you look at all the major strikes in the last years, the unions uh, often have been only marginally involved, then struggling to claim uh, some of the glory coming from the struggles. Of course, the unions, they are better than others, but those are increasingly, I feel, those that are not uh, politically aligned. So for instance, uh, one, of the, one union that does very interesting work and the only one that tries to do work with the factory workers is NTUI, which is the new trade union initiatives, but the others uh, don't have much dent. And on informal workers, there is a massive engagement, at least in the north, uh, by SEVA the Self-Employed Women Association, with mixed results, depending on where they're operating. Um, the last question was on how women see themselves. Um, what I, um, I have more data on this, on histories, uh, with reference to the home-based sector. Uh, we did a fair amount of work with uh, home workers uh, between the Delhi region and Barili. And uh, what I find <coughs> astounding is uh, differences in gender terms of how people self-represent um, so that, uh, you know, for, for workers have no doubts that they are labor, they are mazdur. 
while women still see themselves as partial workers, as carigars, as you know, sort of mainly artisans. Uh, and uh, there is very little imagination of life outside that. What there is, uh, what's really interesting is when you ask questions about uh, opportunities, uh, as it's very similar to when you ask questions about education, they answer with reference to their children. So they answer with the aspiration they have with reference to their offsprings. Even if, as a matter of fact, uh, a significant percentage of their children will not, in fact, be able to do anything else. So that there is at least uh, you know two or three children that will have to be socialized uh, to the craft, to the work, embroidery in particular, uh, and only few are able to then move elsewhere. So we haven't seen that level of social mobility um, that, for instance, uh, um, in, in other studies, uh, older studies, uh, you you um, instead of seeing, for instance, Naila studies of Bangladesh very different but they do voice it mainly with reference to offsprings. 